Welcome to the first session of the great conversation devoted to the early modern period. We begin with Martin Luther, truly one of the most consequential figures in the history of the world. He was born in 1483 and died in 1546. I want us to think about the, the momentous uh, time in world history that we're looking at here in which the old medieval order, and with it the ancient world too, is giving way to a fundamentally new way of ordering common life, the way that we still live in the modern nation state, the secular um, governmentality that, that, that surrounds us. Luther is an essential figure in this story. He is the figure that makes the break of uh, Western Christendom, uh, he makes it happen. So this is the end of Christendom and the beginning of, of the modern world. If we think about the modern world, it's, it's decisively shaped by Western European uh, ideas and forms of living. I would like us to think about the question, do we feel a need to be rescued or saved from a predicament? Obviously, Luther is driven by this question about salvation, salvation by faith alone. Uh, but even if we don't feel the same religious questions, even if we're not religious, do we have any uh, sense of being in a situation personally, socially, where we're, we're stuck or it's dangerous and we need a way out? Do we need to be saved in some way? That's a way to try to understand what Martin Luther is, is um, existentially grappling with. What, why could he bring about such a a uh, decisive disjunction in the history of Europe, it's because he felt in his own interiority this, this crisis. It's a crisis that was certainly a personal religious crisis, but it wasn't merely that. It had to do with the forces, the uh, immense forces of change that were going on in Europe at the time, too. And we, we're living in a time of, of great distress right now, too, and it, it's, it's worth thinking, do we look to other people? Do we look to some other force, religious or not, uh, to, to save us? What would it mean? And that's really a very important question theologically. What does it mean to have salvation? What, what, what does that come to? And that's really central to the theological questions that are being debated between Luther and, Cath and the Catholic Church. Uh, he was a pious Catholic. He was um, from a family that was moving up into the middle class. His father was very entrepreneurial, but he was also very dictatorial as a, as a father. Uh, he did, though, as a father, provide his son with a great education, one of the schools of the Brethren of Common Life, so that'll be shared with the next figure we deal with, Erasmus. Uh, so that's that's already bringing in these, these changes that have uh, begun to show up in, in Christendom, that is, a desire on the part of the people of God to, um, to have access to religiosity that isn't mediated by the priestly class. Because, as we know, we've talked about this a lot in the, the medieval portion of the Great Conversation, the, the papacy was in deep crisis for centuries, right? We had the, the Babylonian captivity of the church in, in the Catholic sense, which uh, was the Avignon uh, papacy, so not being in Rome, that important city for the whole European imagination. To be Roman was always part of the uh, European soul. The papacy wasn't there for uh, almost a century. And then coming back to Rome enters right into the papal schism. And that was even maybe more devastating because you have multiple claimants saying, if you don't follow me, you're going to hell, and that would be a division that could go all the way down to the, the parish level. So the people in the time of change, because starting from even the end of the 13th century, you've got in the high medieval period, you've got all of that burgeoning reurbanization because of the population growth of the high middle ages. You see that, that intellectual ferment of the scholastic period of Aquinas and Bonaventure. And, and uh, you see Dante, of course, that great pivotal figure whom one could think of as a kind of proto-Renaissance figure. Well, everything gets halted because of 
famine and the early the, the carrying capacity of Europe's agricultural um, uh, fields it just isn't able to support the, the, the population growth. So you already before the Black Death have um, an immense loss of life. And then of course in the middle of the 14th century, that, that century of crisis, we have the, the great mortality. So, so many people are dying, uh, the plague keeps coming back, and so that delays what is already showing up in Giotto and Dante, right? A kind of Renaissance. So Renaissance keeps, keeps getting put off. It really shows up in the 15th century. So that's leading into this, um, the Reformation period. The figure we ended last semester with was Machiavelli. So we're, we're dealing with a figure who overlaps this, this time frame. So you have the humanism of the Renaissance, which we'll deal with more with Erasmus. You have all of these forces and, and, the people of God want to deal with all of these, these this, uh, I mean, unthinkable uh, scale of death, the, the immense economic changes, both boom and bust, uh, the attempts to re uh, to re-enslave the population of Europe, to make them serfs again, and all, I mean, just so many things. And the people of God want to be able to reach God. They, they feel they need to be saved in some obvious way from their predicament, at least to have their souls comforted. Brethren of common life were one way of dealing with this, this spiritual energy. So Luther has some training there. He's walking through a field uh, one day, he says later, and accounts for his, his change of life when um, his father had set him on the path to uh, become a lawyer. He, so his father at least was trying to make sure he gets a good education. He's walking through a field a uh, storm comes up suddenly and lightning strikes near him and he calls out to St. Anne and says, uh, if you save me, I'll become a monk. And that's, uh, you promise to God, you keep your promise. That's what Luther does. His father's furious, but Luther joins the Augustinians in 1505. He's ordained a couple of years later. Uh, it's clear that he's a very smart man. That, that is very clear reading uh, Luther. He's a very persuasive, uh, very thoughtful thinker when he's not you know, railing against Jews or something, but he's, he's, he is a very, uh, he's a very acerbic writer too. He gets at, at things. Okay. Uh, his mentor, uh, leaves to, uh, be part of the new university of Wittenberg, uh, Wittenberg in, uh, 1508 and Luther follows him. This is a new institution of higher learning, uh, formed by Friedrich, the third, the wise, the elector of Saxony. Remember that in the Holy Roman Empire, the emperor is elected by seven uh, of the princes of the hundreds of princes in the German lands. So uh, Luther will have this great patron who is a very devout Catholic, uh, has, has a huge relic uh, collection and so on, but uh, Friedrich is also a man who has his own agenda and is playing the game that many German princes are playing um, as far vis-a-vis -vis the, the emperor that is their overlord. Okay, Friedrich forms the University of Wittenberg. Luther becomes a professor there after his studies in 1512, starts teaching scripture. One of the books, of course, he deals with is he's excited to receive the, the New Testament translation by Erasmus, and that has a big effect on him. Okay, he hears word in 1517 that uh, indulgences are being sold in a nearby territory. A lot of his people, his flock that he's preaching to as, as a town preacher for Wittenberg, uh, are, are caught up in this indulgence sale. And he's worried because he's a very scrupulous man. He, he's, he was always the monk who mortified himself more than anyone else. He was afflicted by what he called anfechtungen, that is, he, these tribulations, these, this, this sense that he was being judged very harshly and he just he had to keep trying to do more to satisfy an angry god that is and he comes to this view that in fact the only way to be penitential is to hate yourself to want yourself to be damned that was his view. that's where he's coming from he, so he's he's got this deep personal uh, uh, sense of i mean no way out that hell is where he belongs and that's that's the matrix of his of his mind here so, but he's very serious as a Catholic, and he's saying it's being preached by this Dominican Tetzel that uh, who was sent to sell these indulgences that, you know, you, you 
you know, the, when the coin in the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs, right? It's, it's, this was a mechanical thing that you could just pay money, buy an indulgence, and then you wouldn't have to go to purgatory. So the, the whole question about indulgence is it's this theological question about uh, the difference between eternal punishment and temporal punishment. If you go to confession, the sacrament of confession, according to Catholic belief, you are uh, the eternal punishment, the eternal the, the guilt of any serious sin is remitted, and the, the eternal punishment, which is due, which is separation from God forever, that is hell, uh, that's, that's wiped away. But what remains is temporal punishment. So the, the whole, we have to think about this in terms of not just concepts, but what does this mean? So the Christian view is that to be right with God, to be just, and that has the sense of verticality, to be in right order with God, means to um, have the indwelling spirit of God, to have God's will be my will. And that's lost in the fall, according to Christian faith, that, that the original human and then each human afterwards replace this drama where we, we choose our will and not God's will. And that lack of the original communion, of that original friendship, is what uh, is called original sin. It is to not be, to, to lack the friendship with God that God wants us to have. So, when we are baptized, according to Christian faith, we're, we're justified again. We're put back in right uh, relationship. But then, of course, we go on and sin, because we all sin. And so confession is there to make us right again. Um, so being right, that is being in, in, in love with God, to be in that relationship that, of intimate uh, love with God, is to, that, that's the way to heaven, as it were, right? It's, it's the opposite of hell. Hell is to lack the uh, intimacy with God forever. So if you go to confession and you make a good confession and you do the penance that the priest prescribes, then some, at least, of the temporal punishment. So there's eternal punishment, which is hell, but there's also temporal punishment. That is, when we do things that are against love, we, we cause disorder in the world and disorder in ourselves. And so that's, that's a punishment. That is, we, if we tell a lie, we have now this, this, maybe this tendency in ourselves to, if I'm in another jam, I'm, I'm gonna, it's going to be a little easier maybe for me to, to lie again to get out of the jam. So that's a, it's a deviation from right order. So that's, that's, um, that requires to be satisfied by a temporal punishment, which the Catholic Church calls, if it happens after this life, it, it's called purgatory. Now the sense, the popular sense of purgatory here isn't Dante's sense. It has become a sense of a kind of a cut-rate hell. And it's like, it's almost as bad as hell. It's really something horrible, horrible, horrible. Where in fact, of course, purgatory, as you see in Dante, is, is meant to purify, so spurning away those deviations. But it's something that you want to get through because you want to get right with God. You want to have the ability to love God fully. But at this point, the popular notion and what's often preached is the sense that, that, that purgatory is almost like hell. It's just really bad stuff. Don't, you don't want to have any temporal punishment time to serve. So indulgences are one way of trying to remit the temporal punishment, including purgatory, for yourself and for your dead loved ones. And um, we, we've heard of Pope Leo X before in, in our lectures from last semester. We know that he was a Medici Pope. He helped to um, get the Medici's back in, in place and, and to secure the Medici power in Florence. Um, he was the Pope who's, who really got the St. Peter's project. Um, he's the one most responsible for trying to get this done. And ironically, it's because the, the money needed to, to, to build that beautiful structure is going to be part of the story that behind the breaking of Christendom. Albrecht of Brandenburg is the Archbishop of Mainz, along with holding other benefices of the church. So he's, he's one of these specimen A of all that's wrong with the church. So the selling of church offices, simony, he's a pluralist, he's got different um, bishoprics that he's overseeing, he, therefore he's an absentee bishop, he can't actually take care of his flock. I mean, it's just horrible. You've got all the people of God who actually take all this stuff seriously, and you've got clerics from the Pope on who are playing a game with these uh, offices. 
Albrecht had uh, to pay a large annate for the uh, Archbishopric of Mainz, because, not least because it is one of the electoral uh, seats of the Roman Holy Roman Empire. So uh, he has this huge debt to pay. That that that's meant to help build St. Peter's. He says, uh, and he got the money from the Fuggers, and the debts being called in, and he doesn't know what to do. So he talks to the Pope and he says, "Look, let's have a big indulgence sale, and we can both." Um, make out on this. So that's what happens. Tetzel sent to sell indulgences. He's a very crude preacher and, and it's basically saying you can just pay money and do whatever you want. And and Luther is is just appalled because he believes that this is very serious business. The, the thought is that the Pope can dispense the treasury of merits of Christ and the saints in order to remit the temporal punishment. And so that's where the issue of papal authority some, comes in, but it really isn't um, it really isn't Luther's first concern, the issue of papal authority. He's just very concerned about this, this matter of how indulgences work and how you can actually take seriously the whole confessional sacramental order. So he, he pins to the door of the church in Wittenberg the 95 Theses, which are really, uh, it's an academic exercise. He's, call, he's putting these forward as if for a university disputatio. A disputation. Uh, the, the, the theses themselves include a lot of, uh, they're kind of a, what, a stratigraphic record of his own psyche. Early on, you've got theses that indicate that he's, he, he's, he senses that the point of penance is to really hate yourself and wish yourself in hell. And then later on, you've got, um, in the later theses, you've got a, a different kind of view popping up. So that's, that's interesting in itself. He, uh, if that gets to the I, sent, I think he sends it to the Archbishop of Mainz, and he sends it along to the Pope. Um, every year, the only formal mechanism that really holds the empire together, other than the formal overlordship of the, the emperor himself, is that there's a parliamentary assembly of all of the princes of the German lands in diets. And in 1518, there was a diet in Augsburg, and Cardinal Cajetan himself, one of the preeminent theologians in the Thomistic tradition. He, he's there to uh, meet with uh, Luther and find out what's going on. They end up shouting at each other, so that, that didn't go so well. The next year, there was a debate in Leipzig. Um, Luther was drawn into that because one of his colleagues was, was challenged by uh, a theologian named uh, Eck, and the question of papal authority is the one that, that, that the papal theologians are most exercised on over. That is not Luther's first concern, but it's, it's the Pope's and his uh, theologians' first concern. There's one of the thinkers, Prierius, pursues the question with Luther and says, do you deny that there are, uh, that the Pope can dispense the treasury of merits as he sees fit? And, and as Luther gets being pushed on the question of papal authority, he begins to think, you know, I don't actually believe that the Pope can do that. Um, there's the specter of Jan Hus, who had been killed by the Council of Constance. So that's one of those things in the background here, because the Pope had to, besides the great crises of the uh, Avignon papacy and the schism, uh, the papal schism, he, the Pope also had to deal with the fact that what set the schism right was a council of the church. And so trying to deal with the conciliaries, the ones who held that the, the ultimate authority and the church should be the general council of bishops, um, required a lot of deal-making by the Pope over decades. And so this, this whole uh, specter of, um, of challenging papal authority is something that they're very neuralgic about, and that the Popes are very neuralgic about. And that's, a, of course, that's a position of, of weakness instead of being confident and, of course, just looking at supernatural love as the thing that one is serving, but that's really not in the forefront here. Priarius even cites a canon to Luther and says that, you know, look, you see this? We've held that if the Pope even leads souls to hell, he can't be removed from office. And, and Luther's just, he says, who in his right mind believes that? It's a good question. And, and so Luther starts to think, you know, the Pope is the Antichrist, and so there, there it is. I mean, he, he wasn't really looking to break from the church, but 
at this point it's going to happen. 1520, he writes three important books and address to the uh, Christian nobility of the German nation, which is his, his attempt to think about, if you're not going to have papal authority to hold the church together, you need some other authority, and he wants to opt for the secular. That, that doesn't end well, but there aren't a lot of options, either the pope or, or the state, and he chooses the state. Or the, so it's a theocracy. Calvin will later choose collapsing the church and state like Luther, but he, he wants to have a theocratic regime run by the clergymen. Um, the, another important book is the Babylonian Captivity of the Church, by which he's talking about the sacramental system. So he goes right after that. He really wants to destroy the, at this point, he's become very radicalized. He wants to get rid of the notion of the priesthood as a separate class. So he, he, the three estates of the medieval period, you have the, uh, the nobles, the commoners, but you have the clerics. He wants to eliminate one of that class and just have um, two classes. He denies the sacred power, the sacra potestas of the, of the clerical state, and that means getting rid of most of the sacraments. He does leave a few, but, and that includes, um, well, he, he's not going to, he's going to denigrate the, the, the magnificence of the, the Eucharist, which is, of course, the key to the sacramental system. All right, so he's on his way, and then there's the third book, is on the freedom of the Christian, which we are using as our uh, excerpt in this, um, for the great conversation. And there, we're, we're really talking about th these issues that we'll hopefully wrap up with here. He is ex excommunicated in 1521, and uh, he goes on in that year to have to face the um, diet in Worms, diet of worms, standard joke there, right? But um, he has to face the secular authority because once the Pope has excommunicated him, he is technically an outlaw and about to kill him without right repercussion, but he needs that, uh, uh, for that to happen, the, the papal judgment has to be reconfirmed by the, the secular authority. Uh, in 1519, Charles V had been elected the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, and he's a very, very, very important figure in history of this century. Um, and he, he had, he's the one who's presiding on the Diet of Worms. And Luther's invited in before all the princes of the German nation and their, his books are there on the table. And he's asked, he's told, you need to recant or you're, um, you're gonna be an outlaw. And he ends up by saying, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. So here there's that very modern sense of he's, there's this one man, here I stand, as the, as the folktale goes, I can do no other, of one man's conscience against all the powers of the earth. Uh, so just briefly about the, more of the theological background, he says later that the verse that got him was reading Romans 1.17. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed, and righteousness is another way of talking about justification to be right with God. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed as it is written, he who is righteous lives by faith. Meaning, for Luther, the man who's tormented when he was younger about doing enough religious work so that God, the accuser, won't damn him to hell. What he wants, what he hears in this verse suddenly is, I don't have to do all of those works anymore. The righteousness of God is not God's judgment, which is the way he'd been reading it. He's saying the righteousness of God means his justice is being imputed to me. So I don't have to do anything. And that will later be summed up in that uh, tag. Simil justus et peccator. That is, I'm at, the Christian is at the same time justified and sinner. Same time just and sinner. That is, the righteousness of God is not something that gets inside me. I'm just the same rotten sinner as always. I'm just, I'm just junk, damn worthy, completely. But God imputes his own righteousness upon me. That's what he reads. The righteous will live by faith. And so now I'm right with God because God says I am, not because he changes me. Now, the, the big conflict there in, with Catholics um, is that this notion of justification from a kind of Catholic perspective is, leaves out the whole work of sanctification, which is a way of talking about increasing justification. 
if justification means having an intimate relationship with God, to be sanctified is to have to grow in intimacy with God. It is increasing justification. And it seems to a lot of uh, us as Catholic uh, thinkers that that's in fact something that Luther isn't really paying much attention to, but that's maybe inside baseball. He thinks he's taking on the Augustinian tradition. That's really important. Uh, Calvin will also maintain the same thing. I've maintained before that Augustine is the primary personality behind the West, if you want to take it as the Western European soul. He's that figure at the end of the Roman Empire, at the Western Roman Empire, and and both Catholics and Protestants, or uh, Western Catholics and, and Protestants, they both look to this figure. So it's a debate about how to interpret Augustine correctly. Gabriel Beale, a, a, a late medieval thinker that uh, Luther is going to disagree with here. He said, Beale is saying this common sense notion, if you do what you can, God will help you. And Luther is saying, and he's reading this off of Augustine, no, non posse non vocare. It is, right now, not possible for us not to sin. There's no other way in any moral activity for us to do anything but do damn worthy things. That's his reading of Augustine, which is not impossible as a reading of Augustine. It depends on what time period of his corpus you're you're looking into. So here he ends up with these three solas, right? Not by works am I justified. Not by works am I saved. Not by trying really hard and, and, and fasting a lot and, and mortifying my body in other ways. It is by faith alone, sola gratia, through faith alone, sola fide. Not by works. That's, that's the whole Lutheran basis. And Luther is saying this is freeing because I no longer have to I no longer am scrapping around trying to become really good for God. I can't do any of that. It's only God who can impute his goodness to me. And against papal authority, he's going to say sola scriptura. And that's, that's his, his conscience is going to be bound by his uh, devotion to scripture. But also, as he says before that quote, by what I see by my reason. And that's going to be the thing that the secular modern world will, will really ride with. So... Um, there's a lot to think about. We'll try to think about it through this whole semester because what Luther opens up is the, it, he does, even though he's, he's a serious Christian, he opens up this, the way to the secular nation state by giving the German princes a, a, a lever to, to practically break the hold of the, the Catholic Church, expropriate the lands of the Catholics, and so on. Um, but also because He's saying there isn't another power. You know, it's not Pope and Emperor. It's just, it's just the secular ruler. And when you make it no longer a diarchy, when it's no longer two competing forces, the one that's left is what's there to check that power. So that's that's one of the the, the conundrums that we're left with by by Luther's um, very existential crisis. And we want to see for ourselves whether. In our own lives, is there a way to deal with a crisis, to deal with the predicament we might feel we need to be saved from in a way that might be open to more moderating tendencies to, so we can work on this predicament that we're in together?